remove myself. Hmm.
is not in the cards, how are the American people to understand why this is a priority for them? First of all, the cause of freedom is being fought all over the world, but no place more so than Ukraine. Here you have a country that is sovereign, independent, part of Europe, freedom-loving. You know, they decided back in 2014, they went through a process there where they kicked out their Russian-backed authoritarian uh, government. And they said, we want to be a democracy. We want to follow free markets. We want to be like America and like Western Europe. And uh, so now, unfortunately, uh, Hello, hello. You're alive, Gene. Here I am. Here it is. How are you doing? 
I'm still here. <laughs> now, if Dave would just pick one pitcher, it'd be fine. It, it, who? Dave Wilson, his pitcher keeps moving. <laughs> well, that's me. Yep. We've been enjoying the show. Who was me? Me is probably me. Or me might be you. No, it wasn't me. Somebody with a lot of beard. That John? No, that would have been Dave. That would have been Dave. Dave? Yes. White beard? Yeah. That's Dave. Dave Walsh? Wilson. Wilson, oh, hi, David. No oh, Tony yet. <laughs> I look like I'm in the dark. Sound. Maybe it's not on yet. What? <clears throat> Mel's are moving, but I can't hear them. Where'd they go? There I go. What did I do? Hey, Debbie. Hi, Jean. Hey, quick question before we start. De Deb? Yep. If you have COVID, you've had COVID, how soon can you take get the booster? Well, believe it or not, you can get the booster as soon as you are recovered. So, oh, right. Um, some people like to wait a few weeks after they had COVID, though. I mean, your antibodies are pretty high still. And... Okay. Uh, you know, some people it takes it takes longer to recover from COVID than ten ten days. So. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm one of them. Right. It took a while. Yeah. Hello. Okay, um, 
Is everybody ready? It's um, 6.31. Looks like we're all here, Slackman Canty and Colin and me, town administrator. So uh, with that, let's uh, call the Board of Slackman meeting uh, of January 19th, 2022 to order. Good evening. We're being joined by the um, housing board as well tonight. Uh, first item on the agenda is a uh, is a COVID update. Okay. Step. okay. Um, well, today was a very busy day. We actually had fifteen new cases that just came in today, um, and they're still they're still coming in. They've been coming in all day, which uh, brings our monthly total for the month of January uh up to 116 cases and remember those are only the cases yep. that are having pcr tests those don't even include all of the home tests that um people are doing now so we, we we really haven't turned the corner yet um of seeing our caseload go down um unfortunately I learned today that the Jesmond has five new cases uh, that were actually rapid tests. So I'm waiting for all those PCR tests to come in. They should be coming in by tomorrow. Um, the good news is that the school this week only has, um, right now, um, there was just one active case this week. Um, but three new cases were found today in the, from the pool testing that was done on Tuesday. Um, there's a lot of news now for the school. I don't know if everybody saw the governor yesterday and there was a special meeting today with uh, Desi about the changes that the schools are gonna be making um, as far as testing goes. And beginning the week of January 31st, uh, there will be no more test and stay programs if you opt in for the new program. Rather, uh, there will be pool testing once a week at the school, and then there will be home testing um, once a week on, a, on obviously on a different day than the pool testing. And then it will be up to the parents uh, to let the school know if uh, they have a positive case in one of the students. So that just, um, like I said, that's brand new. It just came out yesterday. That was a big meeting today. Um, and I know our school uh, is on board with it because um, they were all part of the meeting today and we met about it this week. Um, the vaccine data that we have, unfortunately the vaccine data, the new weekly data comes out tomorrow night at five o'clock. So our updated statistics are all now on our uh, webpage for the town of Nahant under COVID. So we still, um, we're still, we're doing good. I don't, you know, I posted it last week. I don't know what the numbers are for this week because like I said, it doesn't come out until tomorrow. Um, and then we'll update the, um, we'll update the website once a week. There, there it is, that's our latest, thanks Tony. Um, but again, a lot happens in a week. Um, and so, it's important to know right now for people that are uh, close contacts in their quarantine status. So if you had somebody that was positive in your household and you were fully vaccinated with no symptoms, you didn't have to quarantine. However, uh, DPH has changed um, the guidance now. So you don't, you're no longer considered fully vaccinated you're considered up to date if you have had a booster. So if you're in the age group where you are eligible for a booster and it's been over five months since you were fully vaccinated, you are not considered up to date unless you've had the booster. So what that means is if somebody in your house is positive and you're asymptomatic, but um, you have had your booster, you don't have to quarantine. However, if you haven't had your booster, you do have to quarantine. So that's also um, new guidance that came out this week. As far as our test data, that does come in on Wednesdays. And so we updated it 
tonight, I up, it was updated on the website. So we had 606 uh, tests done between one January 2nd and January 15th. And out of that, we had 89 positives. So that again is the PCR test. So we're still, um, we're still pretty busy. Um, I think that's about all I have to report. We've, um, <clears throat> we've added on the website, uh, as well as, you know, updating our positive case numbers um, and our booster information. Uh, we've been keeping up with providing, you know, new resources that come available. Uh, for instance, you know, the testing kits that you can order um, from the federal government. Uh, you can click this link right here, free at home COVID-19 test. Um, also on the website is our COVID. So since our last meeting, we've put the mask mandate into place. We have a flyer here available for our uh, local businesses uh, that they can, you know, download and print. And we also have our actual order available for them as well. Um, here is your resources for scheduling vaccines. Here are your resources for scheduling testing. And beyond, and these are really like your local, most local convenient options. The next area here is if you can't find any appointments, you know, go down to the, if you're looking for a vaccine, go to vaxfinder.mass.gov. Uh, and if you're looking for testing, go to mass.gov testing location. That'll bring up even more uh, options that are out there for you. And then as you continue to scroll down, these are just recent um, news stories that have been published regarding COVID-19. Uh, the most recent one is the, uh, the Baker Polito administration uh, tool for uh, digital vaccine cards. We obviously uh, encourage residents to, to take advantage of that. You know, while there isn't um, any vaccine mandate in the hot, there are, there is one in Salem. There are, there is one in Boston. It's becoming more popular. And having that digital ID vaccine card uh, will be helpful for you because uh, not everybody brings their actual vaccine card with them everywhere they go. Um, hey, so we're looking at this booster data and speaking with Deb, um, obviously we're going to have new numbers tomorrow. But this age range between 16 and 64, uh, you know, we obviously want to see that see that climb. Um, there's no knowing, there's no telling uh, if everybody in that age range is five months away from their last uh, dose, which you have to be in order to get boosted. Uh, so it may not mean that, um, you know, the, the difference isn't, uh, is eligible, but we'd like to try to, we talked about, you know, maybe putting out some new uh, press release or targeted outreach for that age group about the importance of getting boosted and, and where they can find appointments for that. Tony, two questions, if I could. Uh, one, what if we drop those flyers off to the local businesses? We did. Just so, we know they, they, so we know they have them in hand. Our uh, health agent, John Coulon, actually delivered uh, multiple copies of those posters and a copy of the actual order to each oh, of those places. Excellent. The, the other question is, we, we had talked about ordering test kits. Will, will we continue on with that now that we've got the opportunity for people to get them from the government? Yeah, uh, so we, we have our order in. Um, <clears throat> I think that, you know, we probably don't need to order as many because of these, uh, all, these alternative resources that are free and available, um, but our order is already in um, now. You know, they, 
all the manufacturers uh, are struggling to fill these orders because the demand for these tests is just so high. Um, additionally, to the federal government option, the school, Deb, jump in here if I get mm -hmm. this wrong, but my understanding is that the school now will be receiving a test for every student and every teacher every week that right. they can take home. Right, so all of the families that um, opt in for this new program that I was talking about will be getting enough uh, home tests to continue. This is gonna go from January 31st until April 22nd. So they will receive on a, a weekly basis, enough tests so that they can continue to test their students one times a week. And that apply, will apply to the uh, teachers as well. That's great. So this, so they, they were talking today uh, at the meeting that they're gonna start shipping all of these uh, home tests out the week of the 24th so that all the schools will be ready to go live on the 31st. Well, certainly not a lot of good news on the counts. Is that that 89 number, is that currently active? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the, that's the last two weeks, right. <laughs> Just the last two weeks. Although, I mean, on a happier note, I think we, the last time we reported, we had 106 active. So I guess you could say we are starting to come down a little bit, except that today it was just unbelievable how many uh, like I said, you know, you log on in the morning and you have a couple of, but they just streamed in all day long. Um, and they've created new reports now for us because a lot of the municipalities can't keep up with the numbers, you know, if, as far as calling people and doing the contact tracing. Um, so we do have a report now for zero to 18 year olds because uh, the focus is on uh, school-aged and college-aged students so that we can keep them in the school. Um, so, but our cases, um, they span the age groups. I mean, today, today we had probably somebody in every age group that we have on our, on our site. So, um, but, you know, and then the other thing is too, a lot of these people that, that I'm calling, this is the second time having COVID. They had it last year. And now they're fully vaccinated with boosters. And, you know, some of them aren't that, um, you know, not everybody was as pleasant as Gene, as Gene was. <laughs> but uh, we're starting to get some, uh, some angry, angry callers on our- I can only imagine after- You can't really. You re after... One man today was, uh, well, I, I won't go into it, but so people aren't, uh, I, think oh. every, I think everybody's pretty, you know, a lot of people have just, it's been a long time. Yeah. And they don't want to hear it anymore. They don't want to stay in the house. They don't, they just, and you know, they, although they're less sick because they have the, had the vaccines in the boosters, which is, I'm seeing that a lot, very few hospitalizations, but. Um, so I know the, to... I know the, um, you know, the less friendly folks on the other side of the phone, you know, probably stand out more in your mind, but I get nothing but um, compliments about you and uh, Kristen and Anna and, and Cheryl and, you know, and Tony Parentazzi talks about it too. And, you guys are doing an amazing job. So, you know, we thank And they are, that. they're few and far between. I will say, you yeah. know, most of the people are very, uh, you know, very agreeable, but you know, you know how it is. So yeah. hopefully, uh, you know, in a couple of months, I won't even be on this agenda anymore. It'll, maybe it'll just peter out. <laughs> Hope so. I mean, I, I'm guessing that um, the, the numbers are actually missing quite a few people that probably take home, you know, feel right. sick, take a home right. test and never really get into the database. Right. And that's going to increase too, Josh, because as more of these home tests become available to everybody, people aren't going to be looking for the PCR test sites. Number one, their appointments take a while to get now. 
And um, they're also saying if you don't need to follow up anymore with a PCR if you test positive on these antigen tests. So, um, so we'll see what happens to the uh, to all of the test sites going forward. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for the update, John. I don't know if you had anything to add, John Coulon. Uh, you're muted. Bet we're missing some good stuff here. Here we go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so see if the uh, see if it was picked up. Uh, I was going to uh, remind folks that uh, we still have three testing sites uh, in Lynn, <clears throat> and uh, uh, while. Uh, some sites do not take uh, appointments uh, for a period of time when they're all booked. Um, uh, you can still get uh, appointments. And uh, uh, although one site does uh, take walk-ins, I, uh, <clears throat> I do not recommend uh, standing in line in the cold. Um, yeah, you make an appointment and you walk up. And uh, in line with... Uh, 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 what Deb has been talking about uh, earlier today, I was asked once again, just when is this going to end? <clears throat> and uh, of course, um, we don't know. Uh, we have to do what we can. <clears throat> and uh, that led though to uh, a decent discussion about um, uh, the, some of the signs behind the decisions that are, that are being made. <clears throat> so I, I, uh, I do enjoy having these kinds of conversations with folks when people are, are willing to, to ask uh, uh, questions uh, about the specifics of, uh, of what, what we are doing. <clears throat> and I get from people that uh, they do trust that uh, what we are trying to do is in everyone's best interest. So I've, uh, I've appreciated that, uh, uh, getting that from folks. Uh, otherwise, I have nothing to add. All right, thanks. thanks for that, John. Um, if there's no more COVID um, updates, then we'll move on to opening comments. Mr. Chairman, um, before you do that, I know that this is a, a joint meeting between the Board of Selectmen, Board of Health, and the Hot Housing Authority. Um, Dan, should the Housing Authority, I see most of the members are on, should they open their meeting now? Uh, wait until we get to, to them on the agenda. Yeah, there's no reason not to do it now. So they should just do it now, get it over with, and then they can close out with them. Um, okay. Um, I am Mickey Long, chair of the Nahan Housing Authority. I see we have a quorum uh, with Susan Bonner present and Dave Wilson, um, as well as Kelly Collins, who's the Nahan Housing Executive Director. So our meeting is um, hereby ongoing. Thanks, Mickey. And thanks for joining us, everybody. And uh, Tony, I know that we have um, Jeff Blake on to talk about um, East Point. And after opening comments, I think you are considering to moving that um, out of order uh, to get an update there. And we possibly could move um, the housing authority out of order if that's possible after, after Jeff um, speaks. Sure, we'll, we'll do that, Mark. So we'll do opening comments and then um, hear from Jeff Blake on the status of um, East Point and then we'll switch over to the Housing Authority. That sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so um, before we get going with the opening uh, comment announcements, um, I just want to take a moment for uh, all of us to remember Ellen Steves. Um, Ellen passed away a couple of days ago at age 72. Um, she, she lived in Nahant, I think her whole life. She loved Nahant. She served Nahant uh, much in the, in the pattern of her parents. Um, she served for many years on CONCOM and on the Community Preservation Committee and uh, as well as many other behind the scenes um, activities and contributions to our town. Um, in a cookie cutter world, Ellen was truly a unique individual, uh, which I for one really appreciate. Um, she, she marched to a different drummer or in her case sort of ambled to a different drummer. Um, mm -hmm. in, in addition to her devotion to Nahat, she was a devoted daughter 
uh, regularly getting um, Harriet out well into her 90s and completely blind out for sales on their townie. And whenever you saw that red and white striped townie sail, you knew Ellen was out there enjoying her time in the water. So um, I just want to remember Ellen and, and uh, thank her for everything she's done for the town. And, and it was a privilege to know her. Thanks for that. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. Well said. Um, okay, so with that, uh, the winter parking ban is in effect until March 20th, 2022. All vehicles must be parked off the street from 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. The hot DPW is seeking plowed, snow plow drivers. Contact Mary Lowe at mlowe at nahant.org or at 781-581-0026. Um, the Council on Aging Board has a vacancy. There's an open seat on the Council. Um, on the council, visit nahat.org for a full description of the board's mission and duties. If interested, send letters of interest to ktaylor at nahat.org. Um, I guess that's it for um, opening comments. Um, Mr. Collinan or Mr. Canty, do you have any additional? Um, just again, want to uh, thank the, the uh, uh, Everybody in town who helped us through this last storm, uh, police, fire, and DPW um, all did a great job and um, seemed to be on top of it um, during the whole storm. So great job, Tony. And please pass my um, uh, pass along. Um, job well done. A second that. Anything else, Gene? No, that's it. All right, with that, we'll, um, we're gonna go um, a bit out of order here. Um, we've asked Jeff Blake, our town council, to give us an update on uh, preserving East Point. There's, there's a few different legal proceedings uh, ongoing and, and Jeff has a, uh, uh, another meeting he's gonna jump on too quickly. So we're gonna uh, go out of order and uh, hear from Jeff Blake now on the status of uh, preserving East Point and the, and the legal proceedings related to that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, a Happy New Year to everyone. I haven't seen everyone in, in quite a while. I hope everybody had a, a, a wonderful holiday season. Um, so as you pointed out, um, I do have somewhere else to go, but, I, but I've got plenty of time. Um, one of the things that I want to mention right up front is we've got litigation. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six cases out there right now. They are all in active litigation. Um, I'll give this uh, update to everybody just to kind of let everybody know where we are in the process. Uh, but I would rather not discuss litigation strategy or the like um, for, for obvious reasons. Um, but I'll jump right into it. And I, I'm going to try to go somewhat in chronological order. Um, as you may recall, in the very beginning, uh, back in 2019, I believe it was, um, NPT, the, 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 new, uh, <clears throat> the Nahant Preservation Trust and 27 citizens sued uh, Northeastern University claiming that they had dedicated um, those portions of East Point uh, to the public use as a wildlife preserve and for passive recreation uh, of its property on top of and east of the, of the bunker. Um, as a result, they have uh, created a easement, if you will, or conservation restriction over the land and the land is protected by Article 97 and could not be developed. Um, Northeastern University at about the same time uh, filed an action in land court uh, wanting a declaratory judgment, which is essentially a court saying these are the rights of the, in, uh, of the parties. They're requesting a, a declaratory judgment that they had not, in fact, dedicated it to the public use and that essentially we were wrong. Um, one of the cases from NPT was brought in the Superior Court. The other one from Northeastern was brought in the land court. Um, after some, some motion practice back and forth, NPT prevailed and claimed that it was an issue of fact uh, for a jury to decide. Land courts do not have juries. So the courts consolidated both of those claims in the Essex Superior Court. Currently, um, discovery has concluded. And for those that don't know, discovery is essentially each side getting to ask the other side for documents, answers to questions, and depositions. Uh, we have deposed and we have uh, completed discovery. 
Um, also, I, I guess I, I'm leaving out an important part of the NPT versus uh, uh, and 27 citizens versus Northeastern and the Superior Court. Uh, the town ultimately joined uh, that proceeding and added an additional claim that the town um, uh, re relied on, called promissory estoppel, relied on claims uh, that Northeastern continued maintenance of its property as a wildlife preserve and for passive re recreation when it dedicated and renovated the, the uh, Lodge Park. So we have also made a claim of promissory estoppel uh, that because we believed that the that Northeastern had dedicated this, we took actions to our detriment now uh, based on that reliance. Again, all of these two cases and the, the, all the, the various issues in those cases are now lumped in together. Uh, discovery has closed. There's no more depositions. There's no more transfer or uh, exchange of documents or answers to interrogatory, answers to questions. And we are now at what is known as a dispositive motion stage. And a dispositive motion is just that. Um, it is, we file a motion based on the evidence that we have gathered that says, no matter, you know, based on these undisputed facts, we win as a matter of law. And the other side says the same thing. Northeastern has actually served us with what is known as a summary judgment. That's the dispositive motion um, on both NPT and the town and the haunt. Um, opposition to this summary judgment motion is due early in February and a hearing will be scheduled thereafter. In the event that uh, the summary judgment motions are granted, the case is done, at least at the superior court level, either side could uh, appeal to an appeals court. But in the event that uh, that a court does not have summary does not grant summary judgment, and one of the reasons for not granting summary judgment may be that, as I said before, we're going to say that the undisputed facts show that as a matter of law we win. Um, the other side may say, wait a minute, we dispute that critical fact, and without that critical fact, town you can't win, and vice versa. Town saying that about Northeastern University. So to the extent that there are any issues of material fact that are outstanding, then a court would deny the motion for summary judgment and we'd be off to a, a jury trial in this case. And the trial date is set for October 31st, uh, 2022. Um, so as it stands right now, we are, we are in the process of drafting our opposition and it will be a cross motion most likely for summary judgment uh, and serve it on the other side in February. Uh, the way these things typically go, we will serve it pursuant to the, the Superior Court rules early February. The court will, will uh, the, the other side will um, file it with the court. Uh, I suspect that we would probably see a summary judgment hearing sometime in March, hopefully early March. And then once that summary judgment has been he heard by a court, they will take it under advisement. And this is a pretty comp, this could be a pretty complicated case in some respects, certainly with the facts. Um, so a court may take some additional time and that, that could be anywhere from two to six months. Um, so, you know, I anticipate getting some type of decision out of a court on the summary judgment, probably sometime in the summer. Um, so those are the, that, those are the, that was the first round of cases. Um, the next, and, and I, there, there is this, as we all know, there's the uh, taking by eminent domain under chapter 80A uh, by the town. Um, but rather than, rather than, than me going into that one, um, I'm just going to jump over the other ones and I'll come back to this. Um, as, as a lot of you may know out there, Northeastern, um, even though we, uh, we, we uh, served them with a complaint, and an, an intention to take, notice of intention to take, they've continued to move forward and permitting um, the number one, the 55,000 square foot building on top of the Murphy bunker, and number two, a seawater intake expansion project that they had going. Um, what they needed to do to permit that was they needed to come to our conservation commission. And our conservation commission held multiple hearings on both of those. It's called a notice of intent. You come to the Conservation Commission with a, essentially saying, I want to do this project. Conservation Commission looks at it and says, 
oh, okay, you can do it, but we're going to condition it this way, or no, you can't, or please give us more information and we'll make a determination. Well, um, they filed their notices of intent on both, on both projects, the seawater intake expansion and uh, the 55 square foot uh, building on top of the bunker. There were certain areas of that project that were within the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. Uh, yet, remember that the Conservation Commission doesn't have jurisdiction over any building in town. It has to be within one of our resource areas or a buffer to that resource area. And we have uh, a couple of different um, uh, resource areas that, that even the 55,000 square foot building on top of the bunker um, implicated. So we went to hearings. Um, the applicant, uh, let, me, let me backtrack a little bit. Uh, under this conservation commission, it, it's a, it gets a, a, little, a little complicated and maybe a little confusing. We have what is known as the Wetland Protection Act, and that is a state law. The Wetland Protection Act protects certain areas, resource areas. Uh, municipalities are authorized to um, to adopt their own wetland protection bylaws, not the Wetland Protection Act, but bylaw. And within that bylaw, they can be more stringent than the act, meaning they can protect additional areas. For example, a hundred foot buffer zone to a resource area. So when an applicant files a notice of intent for, <clears throat> excuse me, when an applicant files a notice of intent for doing a project that implicates both, they have to get two decisions. They have to get one under the Wetland Protection Act, and they have to get one under our, under the uh, Wetland Protection Bylaw. So, with respect to Northeastern, the Conservation Commission heard and decided under the Wetland Protection Act that that they met the requirements of the Wetland Protection Act and granted that part of the notice of intent. However, with respect to the wetland protection bylaw, our own town bylaw, um, Northeastern did not provide them with the necessary assurances, nor did they address some of the concerns and criteria that we had in our wetland protection bylaw. So we denied it under the wetland protection bylaw, both projects. So as a result, um, the the, 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 the matter now will go to the Superior Court. An appeal of a denial under the Wetland Protection Bylaw goes to a Superior Court under what is known as a record review. And under that standard, a municipality or a deciding board or commission has 90 days to assemble the record. And the record is what was before the commission or a board, in this case, the Conservation Commission during its decision. We literally will put together a, uh, an append, an, uh, a record appendix, which will have every document that was ever produced in that, in that, uh, during those hearings and during the notice of intent, we will put it together. You know, now it's electronic. We used to actually bind them. It would be a book. It would be a record appendix. And based on that record, each party will then make uh, its arguments uh, through what is known as a motion for judgment on the pleadings. The way this works is the, 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 the town, the commission files its record of appendix within 90 days from the date of the, of the appeal. Uh, then the, the, the appellant, the person appealing, in this case, Northeastern, has 30 days to draft a motion for judgment on the pleadings and serve it on the town, saying that we think we win because X, Y, and Z. The town then has 30 days to oppose that motion and cross move and say, we think you're wrong and we think we're right and here's why. And then we file it with the court. The court um, typically will hold a hearing and we'll take it under advisement. We haven't even, and I, I believe the record is due sometime soon. Um, we haven't even uh, assembled and filed the record in either of those matters yet. Um, but to add a little bit more complication, um, and I think some of you may know this, uh, a new notice of intent was filed for the seawater intake expansion project uh, about a month and a half ago. The commission held a hearing. Uh, the commission under the, under the regulations has 21 days to hold the hearing. And if uh, the applicant allows for a continuance, they can, we can continue it. 
But once the, the, the hearing closes, we have 21 days to make our decision. Well, under the new application for the seawater intake expansion project, which took some of the, uh, a lot of the project out of the resource area, uh, we held a, a new hearing and we asked Northeastern to provide us with additional information at that hearing. Um, we also asked Northeastern to give us a brief uh, uh, continuance so that we could, number one, get the new, new information and um, do an inspection of the site. Northeastern um, said no. They denied our request for, an ex for a continuance, which they can do. So <laughs> the commission uh, promptly denied their application for lack of, um, of information that they wanted. That case, as far as I know, has not been appealed. And I believe the appeal period is very close to running, although I have not seen the, the, the Conservation Commission's uh, denial uh, yet. But in any event, that kind of hangs out there. And I know some of you will, will be saying, well, wait a minute, how can they have uh, two projects or they got an appeal of this and then they got another, another, uh, uh, another application? They can do it. Um, you know, unfortunately, they can do it. Uh, but in any event, here we sit with the uh, Conservation Commission's denials under, under appeal, at least uh, for, for two of the, the beginning ones. And I, I likely anticipate a third one. Uh, just so that you know, in order for any building to go forward, a, um, these appeals need to be resolved. Uh, they do implicate uh, some of the areas for the project and they need to be resolved before building permits could be issued. Uh, the next one is um, as, as some of you may know, um, in order for this project to go forward, even um, for a educational and religious use, educational and religious uses are exempt from zoning under the so-called Dover Amendment where, that, that we all know. Um, however, however, in limited circumstances, we can apply our zoning bylaw. Uh, building heights, setbacks, parking, and the like, reasonable regulations. And, and our zoning bylaw in it has a section which is called Site Plan Review for Educational and Religious Uses. The Site Plan Review for Educational and Religious Uses is a, an abbreviated site plan, but it's a site plan nonetheless. And under our zoning bylaw, no, per, no building permit shall issue until site plan review has been uh, has been approved by the planning board. Uh, the planning board held numerous hearings on Northeastern's application for site plan review. Uh, the planning board requested multiple times documentation that uh, the use was in fact an educational use. Northeastern's response to that is, we're a university, of course it's an educational use. Well, um, you know, that's, that's not really what we were asking, number one. And there are plenty of uses that uh, universities make of properties that are commercial and frankly, not educational. Um, so be that as it may, there were additional requirements that we had asked for and, and information that we asked for, and we were not given it. So ultimately the planning board denied Northeastern site plan uh, and did so on number one, insufficient evidence that we, uh, insufficient documentation that we had asked for. Number two, a, a, an interesting issue wherein uh, our bylaw, and I, I just told you that even under Dover, you can limit things like uh, building height. Um, Northeastern's taking the position that they are only building a building that is, I, I think it's 20 feet high or, or less uh, because they're measuring from the top of the bunker from where they're building. Well, in, in fact, the bunker is a structure. And our interpretation is that you measure at the bottom of the bunker, or at least ground level of the bunker up, not from the top up, at, like you would um, for a two story, right? If you had a single family dwelling uh, that it was only one story and you built on the top, you would, you would, you would uh, measure the building height from the, from the, from the bottom of the, of the first story, not from the top of the first story up. So uh, that was another uh, uh, a basis for their denial. And of course, they've also um, and, uh, uh, interpreted their bylaw, uh, our uh, uh, zoning bylaw, the, specifically the natural resource district zoning bylaw as not allowing any um, of the type of development in the district that they are trying to. And there are some cases out there, at least one 
Burlington case, um, Seven Day Adventist versus Burlington, wherein a court said that Dover does not apply to those types of bylaws that are out there to uh, protect uh, the natural environment and uh, uh, and the like. For example, a wetland protection bylaw. So those are the three bases for the planning board's denial. Now that case is relatively new, at least the appeal. Um, Discovery is set to, to begin shortly. Um, in fact, we are drafting discovery re requests as we speak. Uh, the way these things go is before a court it is what is known as a de novo hearing, which means, you know, unfortunately, that the applicant can bring in information that wasn't even provided to the board. Um, but that's just the way the, the way it goes. Typically, uh, applicants don't do that. And if there is significant amounts of information that is provided during the, during the appeal that was not provided to a board, courts are often uh, 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 reluctant to just issue the permit and rather they remand it back to the board and say, hey board, you know, take a look at what we got here, you know, make your determination based on that. Uh, so, Again, the discovery for these things goes on. I think it's a, on a fast track. So we're looking at about 180 days of discovery. That's give or take COVID. Uh, parties can extend the discovery if they want to based on circumstances and, and, and courts can do it. Um, once the discovery is done, I suspect that again, we would uh, evaluate whether or not a dispositive motion is appropriate. And if it is, we would dra draft our dispositive motion the other side would, would, do the, would do the same and we would go to the court and the court would make its determination uh, based on, on those motions. If they're denied, then we go to a, a, a trial. Um, unlike the, tri the, the, the upper two cases that I talked about for you in, at the beginning, um, this is a, is a zoning appeal. There is no right to a jury in this. So it would be a judge trial. Uh, likely we would get um, a little quicker trial, especially in the age of COVID. The, uh, the trial courts have suspended all jury trials for now. Um, so if this being a judge trial, we would likely get probably a quicker, uh, a, a quicker um, determination. But again, you know, we're, we're looking at probably, you know, well into next fall and, and, and maybe winter and, and spring on, on something like this. These cases, you know, a year, year and a half may sound like a long time, but that's pretty fast for the legal system to go. Um, and of course, the last one that, we, uh, that we're probably all familiar with is the um, chapter ADA intention to take. As everybody knows, uh, we filed a, a notice of intention to take. We filed a complaint against Northeastern University. Northeasterners answered that complaint and motion practice and back and forth has already started. In fact, there was a status conference, a litigation control conference today I sat in, it was a Zoom conference, I sat in and listened. Uh, what's currently uh, going on right now is the, the, the parties are attempting to figure out a schedule, discovery and the like schedule uh, for how to best uh, uh, go forward with this case. And the reason being is um, under the statute ADA, and I think it's section seven, it seems to contemplate um, the, if there is a challenge, to the validity of the taking. So when you have a taking, typically what you have is you have the, the two Vs, right? You have the validity of the taking. Was it for a public purpose? If the answer to that is yes, you go on to the next one, valuation. Was the value that the, the town or the taking uh, authority offered to the property owner <laughs> sufficient? Um, so here, not surprisingly, um, usually in eminent domain cases, we rarely have challenges to validity, rarely, but not surprisingly here, Northeastern is challenging the validity, claiming that the town has taken the property in bad faith merely to stop a project, to, to stop their project. Um, based on that challenge, the court is now going to, and, and I think all parties agree, I think they, by statute they should, it's going to, to bifurcate the case. We're going to have two cases going forward, right? The first one that we're going to do, um, we're going to have discovery on whether or not the taking was valid. 
And ultimately, the parties, at least today, back and forth with the judge, uh, believe that after some brief discovery, possibly a few depositions, that, that uh, the issue should be ripe for a dispositive motion. The dispositive motion will be filed on both sides. You know, we win because of X, Y, and Z in the facts, and they're going to say we win because of X, you know, A, B, C facts. Um, the court will make its decision. If the court says it's a valid public purpose, a valid taking, then we go on to the next, the valuation uh, part of it, which, and, and I've, I've gotten up here many times, and so has uh, Jim Masterman, and talked about how the value goes with the with the three uh, three panel commissioners, three commissioners that determine a, a value, the town has the option of, of backing out. If, uh, if after that determination, they believe that the value is too high, there is ultimately an appeal to a superior court jury and, 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 and the like. Um, but so for purposes of, 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 of this conversation, if the bifurcation, if we win on the validity of the taking, we win to go to the valuation. If we lose, we lose and, and it's over. Um, there is no taking because it was invalid. Um, but at this point, the litigation is 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 very uh, new, um, and it, we haven't even gotten to the point where we are putting together a schedule for the uh, discovery uh, on the uh, validity of the taking uh, aspect of it. Uh, we did hash out today, or the I mean, I, I sat in as a fly on the wall with Jim Masterman, um, our uh, eminent domain attorney and their attorney, um, George McLaughlin. And uh, it looks like the parties are scheduled to come back on February 2nd at 2 p.m. to come up with a discovery schedule for the bifurcated trial, uh, for the bifurcation, the validity part of it, and a motion um, schedule, meaning when the, when the, the dispositive motions must be filed. So again, not a, not a, not a uh, not a ton going on there, but it's going on, and it will heat up quick. Once we come up with that discovery schedule, at least for the validity issue, it's going to be condensed and it's going to be pretty fast. Uh, some of the schedules that I've seen, and we're looking out over over you know, a few months, not a year, or something to that effect. Now, once the validity is decided, um, it, it probably becomes a little bit more. Uh, complicated and, and perhaps more uh, discovery intense. So there may be a, a longer wait there, but uh, you know, we're taking it one step at a time. And I think that that's all the cases I got for you. All right, Th thanks a lot for that, Jeff. Um, really appreciate the thorough explanation. I think um, certainly there's a lot of people in town interested in the status of those. So I wanted to have you as our expert come in and explain all this stuff. So appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Is that, is that a preview to law school? Was that like our introduction to a... Uh... <laughs> yeah, that, that's, how we, how that's how the professors get up and talk. <laughs> on and on and on, right? Uh, that's a lot. You covered a lot there, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. It's a, it's a, you know, I mean, there, there was a lot to cover. And I, I know that, you know, everybody, we got 25 people sitting on 24 without me. And I mean, I, I know it, it's just, it, it's, it's really hard to take in, but, um, you know, I, I hesitate to take a lot of questions if you wanted to even ask them because it is in litigation. And, you know, anything that we say is a public record. And I would just rather not give the other side any inkling of where we're going. Yeah, I think that's fine, Jeff. I mean, I think your uh, your explanations were very thorough, and um, so uh, considering your opinion about the ongoing litigation and your your prior commitment, um, I think we can probably move on. All right. It was a, it was a pleasure seeing you guys again, and uh, you know, obviously, when something comes up. Um, we will, we'll update you. Yep. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. See you guys. Take care. Um, okay. Um, let's, uh, let's, um, get into our meeting with the housing authority right, right now. Um, first of all, thank you guys on the 
Housing Authority for coming and uh, you, Kelly uh, Collins, we haven't met yet, but I uh, really appreciate you being on the call today. Um, we hear a lot of good things about what you're doing in the hot, so thanks for being here. Um, so I think um, generally the, the intent here is to uh, keep the Housing Authority appraised of some of the things we've Begin to, begun to work on with regards to housing in town, uh, most notably um, generating a housing production plan, which is something every community should have. And um, with that, um, Mark um, Cullinan has, has uh, is sort of the, taken this project on as, as lead. So um, with that, maybe you can take it from here, Mark. Yeah. Um... Uh, I'll try to open it up a little. I'll turn it over to Tony because he's doing a lot of the work behind the scenes. Um, as you said, um, we've been talking, the board has uh, been talking about uh, trying to address our housing needs. And we have many of them, I think, in town. Um, and what the best way of going about that would be. When I say housing needs, I'm talking about affordability, I'm talking about senior housing, I'm talking about parcels. Um, that could be subject to uh, either a friendly 40B development or unfriendly 40B development. Uh, probably talking about some zoning issues um, that are related to um, how you would approach a housing production plan in the hunt. Um, and so, you know, as we were discussing this, I obviously thought, well, the housing <coughs> needs to have some input in this and as perhaps maybe even the planning board, but, um, the housing authority for sure uh, in terms of what they're doing in terms of affordability in terms of senior housing um, what they see the needs are and how um, they could provide some input into this housing production plan i don't know if that summarizes it tony but you've been working with some consultants on this um, maybe you want to get a little bit deeper can i can i just chime in for one second just for those that don't know um so a 40B development is, a, is an affordable housing development and um, an unfriendly 40B development. Um, if, if, if the town doesn't meet um, the, the state goals for affordable housing, then um, it is subject to the possibility of an unfriendly 40B um, development, which means um, it does not need to comply with uh, town zoning laws. So um, just wanted to explain that. So sorry to interrupt. Go ahead, Tony. Hey, Josh, you might also want to let people know what, what our status is with respect to the percentage of houses or, or buildings that we need to be in that 10% and we're only at 3% currently. Well, I, I can, can just add I can it. get into that if you want. Sure. Uh, so, yes, thank you um, to the board uh, and thank you to the Housing Authority and Kelly for joining us. Um, we, we are very much at the starting line, I would say, on this initiative, um, really looking into, um, you know, the 40B and, and a housing production plan and what our next steps might be. And like Mark had mentioned, you know, bringing you all into the conversation to make sure you're aware of uh, what we're doing, where we are in the process, and really um, let you take that information back and maybe discuss it amongst yourselves at your next meeting and, you know, stay in communication about, you know, what type of involvement you might want to have, um, but certainly no pressure on that. Just want to make sure you guys are in the loop uh, for sure. Uh, we, we, uh, I, as Mark mentioned, you know, we certainly have heard from the town residents about the need for senior affordable housing. Um, and we've also been looking into the recent uh, zoning law change uh, at the state level regarding accessory dwelling units, um, which essentially accessory dwelling, think of it as like an in-law apartment. Um, so our next step was to, you know, communicate with, we actually talked with KP Law about 40B and our general understanding 
um, I'll, I'll get through it at a high level is um, that, you know, every town is required to meet a 10% threshold of subsidized housing inventory. Uh, Nahant's SHI, subsidized housing inventory, is 3%. And all of it is with the housing authority. So 48 units that you control uh, are our only affordable housing uh, that comply with the law. Um, as, as Josh had mentioned, Chapter 40B would allow a developer to override local zoning bylaws um, if we do not meet that 10% threshold, or if we don't have a um, safe harbor to, to rely on. Um, affordable housing must be in perpetuity through a deed restriction and a regulatory agreement with DHCD. It can be for 80%, uh, 60%, 50% of median income, or even less. Um, age restrictions are allowed. Um, and there are three potential uh, safe harbors that, I, that the town can use to, I guess, protect themselves from a unfriendly uh, 40B development. One of those is to meet the 10% uh, housing stock threshold, which as I mentioned, we only have 3%. The other is to meet the general land area minimum or otherwise known as the GLAM um, threshold of 1.5% of the land area of the municipality dedicated to affordable uh, housing. This excludes undevelopable land, undevelopable land such as open space, cemetery, the golf course, um, we don't know where we are in regards to the GLAM, how much of our property, you know, where we meet that 1.5% um, currently. Um, and those safe harbors are reviewed by DHCD uh, when we are trying to utilize them if a, if a unfriendly 40B development were to be proposed to the town. So we have to use what, Tony? Department, Department of uh, Housing, Urban Development, Community Development, Department of Housing, Community Development, Community Development. Thank you. Uh, so, our first step really is we want to take a look at where are we with the GLAM, um, and you know where what where do we want to be with our housing is is let's develop a housing production plan. So one thing that we're going to be doing this year at town meeting is applying to the CPC for funding to hire a consultant to help us develop um, that housing production plan. And the first phase of that would be to assess our status in regards to the GLAM. Um, we had a conversation, we had a, a meeting scheduled for today, it got postponed. Uh, Mark and I did with MAPC uh, to see if they could provide us a, uh, a little bit of assistance as to what that process is in regards to developing such a plan and what the ballpark amount of funds would be required to hire a consultant to do such work. Um, my understanding is it starts pretty much around 30 grand and it grows as um, you know how intense your production plan might become you know, um, larger towns, obviously, the, the price goes up with the size of your community. Um, as, as we talked about earlier, with the accessory dwelling units, it's possible that those units, if they are, if they meet certain requirements, such as a deed restriction, and of course, affordability, uh, could be, could count towards our, um, our SHI, our housing inventory. So we're looking at both that zoning and and if we were to if we were to uh, include that into zoning in the future, how would that how would that help us meet goals with our 40B requirement? Um, but really, step one, as 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 I mentioned, is bringing in a consultant to help guide us, tell us where we are today, 
and then through public or like a robust public process, understand from the community what our needs are and what our options are. Um, so that's that's really where we are right now, and we'll be we'll be submitting that application to the to the CPC next week. Um, so folks, no, this, uh, on on CPC we have. Uh, a seat housing. Dave Wilson has been kind enough to uh, take it up uh, and uh, meet uh, with this high intensity committee who meets sometimes you know, before town meeting almost weekly and by uh, twice weekly. Um, so, one issue I wonder is is it the selectmen's desire uh, to create a subcommittee? Um, of both committees, the Board of Selectmen or, or, or as many uh, committees as possible, planning, housing, and uh, the BOS. Is that um, one initiating um, thought? Well, I don't, I, we haven't gotten that far. As I mentioned, we're really, really early in the process. And our first step was, let's see if we can get some funding, but certainly having a subcommittee of those respective, you know, representatives from those respective committees involved as the, um, you know, to carry us through the housing production plan process. I think that's a great idea. I defer to the selectmen, but, um, you know, it, I think that would make sense. Because, because the funding issue is going to be up to the CPC, obviously, uh, and House was one vote of uh, several uh, seats on there. Um, I, I don't, I certainly am supportive of the entire concepts you just uh, discussed. Um, and I, it's, I forget how long I've been sitting on housing, probably five years. I don't recall, I was taking a vote on, on a particular um, position for CPC. Uh, I'm not sure where the other commissioners would be on that, uh, but we'll cross that bridge when and when and if uh, CPC approves, you know, holds meetings uh, on that issue. Uh, so good. But whatever you guys decide, whatever uh, it is that we can do to cooperate, certainly I agree that a study is uh, something important given the aging demographic uh, and the affordability issue that folks are experiencing everywhere including in this town. So I appreciate your effort. I appreciate the invite and I thank you for it. Yeah, uh, um, Mickey, I, I agree with, um, with Tony. Uh, I, think, I think it would be important and I would encourage a sort of a collaborative um, group to, to work on this. Uh, at some point, uh, it's gonna have to go before town meeting uh, in the form of adopting um, the production housing production plan or even perhaps changing some zoning issues around it so the more uh, of a collaborative approach we make to this i think um, the community would be more likely to um, uh, to agree with um, what we're asking for so uh, weren't, weren't we in the process of putting together a committee to to mm -hmm. deal with this no i think uh, you might be thinking of the uh, short-term rental committee yeah we, we, we've talked about, but we have talked about it. Um, I think Mark brought it up, uh, but, you know, Tony and I met with Amy Quessel, who was an attorney at KP Law, and in the approach that Tony just described is exactly what she was recommending. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of towns that have these production plans and, you know, it's, it's she recommended a few different consultants to to take a stab at creating that for us. And it, it doesn't sound like it's too complicated because there are so many um, communities that have them, uh, communities of our similar size and so on. So um, to some degree, they can kind of leverage what, what's already in place. So, um, but I think, you know, I agree. Um, first thing to do is get the funding so that we can get this thing going and, and um, definitely, that we should have uh, some collaborative effort across, you know. So is that, is that committee still coming together, the short-term rental? Yes, but it's a totally separate issue. Short-term short -term rentals are less than 30 days. So it's different than a house, it's different than housing. Airbnb? Yep, yeah, separate, separate from housing. 
So Airbnbs oh. would be the short-term rental committee. Right. Okay. Thanks. But so just for just for folks to keep in mind, the select board and Tony's Kelly Collins is a part-time um, position. I think it's twenty hours, um, and, and we don't have permission from DHCD uh, for um, any more hours for our legal on the resources. Practically everything um, we do on housing uh, needs permission. Uh, through some agreements that, for funding that we've had uh, and, and for others. So just, just about everything we do, um, Kelly needs to check with folks at DHCD and she's got a good relationship with folks there. Um, so whatever input we have uh, that, or that the town would need from DHCD's approval, uh, my, my sense is if you keep in mind that she's only part-time and she's a, she has to handle what she's already handling. Um, it's not like you could just pick up the phone and send her an email and she could respond that quickly. Uh, the, the other thing, I, I want, so just to sum up, it's my assumption that first, uh, the Board of Selectmen uh, or the town and Hunt will make an application to C CPC. Those of us on housing, the five commissioners, should we choose to attend the CPC meetings? Uh, for input what like that, and I hope we would. Um, once funding, uh, assuming funding is uh, provided by the CBC uh, board, we would wait for the Board of Selectmen of the town to notify housing uh, as to their desire or not for further participation. Is that a good assumption? Yeah, Tony, let me just jump in for a minute. Maybe um, you can answer it, Tony, or uh, uh, Dan. Whether or not we'd have to, we'd want to put in a uh, an article to establish that committee, or whether or not you could just um, put a committee, an, a, you know, a, advocacy sort of committee together ad hoc um, on your own. Either way, um, uh, Dan, you would, Tony could just put a committee together, right? An yeah, that's that's right, and it's actually much more controllable that way because it goes through town meetings, and only town meeting can really set the mandate. And also yeah. to determine its lifespan and whatnot. So it might be better to have uh, the town administrator set up an advisory committee um, for him. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. But yeah, as far as timeline goes, uh, Mickey, I would say yes. I would, I would, I would think we we hopefully get you know a town meeting in May. We get approved. You know, hopefully CPC recommends it, puts it on the uh, warrant for a vote at town meeting. It gets approved and we're able to then hire a consultant and put together a subcommittee that would work directly with that consultant. I almost envision it similar to like the Green Communities Committee or the MVP Committee or the Open Space Committee, which are basically the town's direct line to the consultant. And they would be, you know, heavily involved in um, that process and, you know, setting up public meetings to meet with the consultant and discuss what the issues are in town and, and that whole, that whole process. And I think having a, you know, a representative of the housing authority, a representative of the planning board, a representative of the selectmen, uh, perhaps, perhaps, uh, you know, some residents or, or whatever we might want to do. Um, I think that makes all the sense in the world. But yeah, I think number step one would be to, uh, you know, get the funding for the plan, for the consultant. And funding will come through CPC vote, FinCom approval, town meeting approval. Right. And then we'll put this advisory committee through your office uh, to get, or you'll put this advisory uh, committee uh, through your office, you know, whoever you have to consult with. Right. Okay, great. Thanks. Sounds, uh, sounds interesting. And much needed and appreciate again, appreciate you inv inviting us to uh, participate very early in the process. Well, I wanted to um, say hi to Kelly. I, I think we've met once or twice down to the beach, perhaps, um, um, the husband and kids. But um, thanks for doing the work that you've been doing. Um, I hear a lot of great things about you. And I'm sorry that we just probably went through a quarter of your weekly hours with tonight's meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. This is actually extra, but that's OK. <laughs> Okay. Uh, but I'm sure you'll have a lot of the data uh, and some information that we'll need. Uh, 
So, yeah. However, so, we access uh, that. Yeah. So, can I just ask whether Dave Wilson or Susan Bonner have any questions, comments, or concerns? Dave? No, um, I would be glad to, you know, this is a good, a good step towards finding, you know, like affordable housing and senior housing. As you know, um, seniors are, we're getting old and stuff and some people can't afford houses. So this is a good step in finding, you know, a solution. Thank you, Dave. Susan Bonner, you still there? I don't hear, so, okay. So with that, um, I suspect that it's okay for the housing to adjourn. Yeah, that's right, Nikki. Okay, um, a motion I'll to make adjourn, a Dave. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Uh, Susan, I, we often have problems. I, uh, I'm not so sure she's still here or if she got cut off. Susan, are you there? No, so I no. wonder whether we have a quorum to adjourn. So I'm gonna just close the meeting and if there's an issue, I'll handle it uh, then. Thanks again, folks. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Um, all right. Good. Um, hey, one, one question I, I wanted to ask, and, and I didn't want to interrupt you leaving the meeting, but is there a game plan or a time frame for upgrading some of the, the properties in town that come under their jurisdiction? Um, that might there, be is. there is, and Kelly's still on. I don't know if Kelly, you feel like answering that question, but I know you went before the CPC last year and later in this meeting, we're gonna be providing a little bit of an update on um, CPC articles that were approved at previous town meetings. But, you know, if, if you don't mind, if you have a, a brief answer for Selectman Canty on, you know, maybe those projects. Um, yeah, we actually just recently completed two siding projects for Spring and Emerald Road, and then from CPC and with funding from DHCD, um, we are working on a design plan right now for residing and new windows for the Greystone property. Um, it's still into the design phase, um, but then once we get that going, we're hoping to meet, do a joint meeting between DHCD and CPC um, to get that finalized and hopefully get going in the spring. Um, and then we also have a window project that should be getting started for not just one, but there's a few windows of all of the Spring and Emerald Road properties that need new windows. Um, they're all leaking. So we have that project coming up. Um, those are our two CPC projects at the moment. And then we just completed another major fire alarm project at the Spindrift. Um, we've definitely been busy. That's great. Thank you for uh, giving us the input. If you guys have any other questions, feel free. I'll be here for another few minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, so um, we do have an agenda item to review the CPC articles that were approved at the 2021 annual town meeting. And um, Lynn Spencer is on the, on the Zoom call to give us an update and um, if you would like, Lynn, we can um, move that item out of order as well. Um, it's kind of a nice segue from Kelly. Um, I'll leave it up to you. Um, no, that, 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 that's fine. All right, let's, let's do that then. So Lynn Spencer is the chair of the Community Preservation Committee and um, we'll give uh, us- Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, can I just jump in? I um, I just don't want to be in violation here, but I noticed we have a national grid public hearing um, tonight. Is that still on, Tony? Yes. Um, that was advertised in the item. Was there a time advertised for that, Dan? Yes. You. Thank you. I'm sorry, Lynn. Thank you for bringing that up, Mark. Um, it was probably advertised for the start of this meeting, so we should we should we should get it done. If, uh, sorry, Lynn. We're already. It's late. all right. I'll go back to uh, you know what I was doing before, but I'll I'll keep listening. Okay. Dan, is there? Are you? Are you comfortable with us getting it? I know we're already late, but 
with yeah, no, I'm, I'm fine with that. Out. I mean, it's uh, it, it, if we start going late, that's okay. Just make sure we invite public comment. That's the only thing I would have. So, what would the um, does the board of selectmen have to vote to open the know, meeting? Open the yeah. open the hearing? Yeah. Yeah, they certainly can. They don't really have to. But they certainly can. There's no there's no there's no. Problem. All right, let's let's do that. Do we have a motion? Um, I open. I, I I move to open um, the National Grid public hearing. Second. Okay. Discussion. We have a representative on the. Hi. Good evening. My name is Adele Wahed Nabat at one seventy Medford Street, Malden, and I'm here on behalf of a customer at one sixteen Willow Road, in the Hunt. Um, we're petitioning. This is a customer-driven job and it is to serve them a, a permanent service that will be an underground from a service pole that is within three feet of their property. And the customer is gonna be installing a two, three inch conduits. Like I said, it will be three feet. So this is an electrical? Um, yes, sir. Underground electrical? Yep. Uh, what did you say the number was, 161? Uh, no, 116 Willow Road in the hot. Yep. Well, Mr. Chair, he should identify that person as the resident. What was that, Dan? He should identify that person if that's a resident of town. He's representing them today at this hearing. Looks like um, the Jenkins, I guess. Am I allowed to say yes. that? Hey, Jenkins. Yeah. Oh, hey, Carl. Hey. Um, no. All right. So, what's the next step of this hearing, Dan? Uh, so, if there's any opposition, Mr. Chairman, um, you could hear that now. Anyone in support of it, you could hear that also. Um, well, I like the aesthetics of underground electrical service. So, Sounds like a good idea to me. Me too. Uh, is there anybody on that is in opposition to this? Here is, I will, uh, I, I just pulled up the, um, the petition. So I'll give a visual for those that are on the line. This is uh, the corner of, at the corner of Willow Road and Winter Street. Uh, and it, as you mentioned, it's because it enters the town sidewalk is, is I believe where we're um, conducting the public hearing. So basically what this does is provide our national grid easement for that piece of equipment in our sidewalk. Uh, and as you said, uh, Josh, um, I wish more things could be underground um, in terms of why is and as such. So um, I'm, I'm certainly supportive of this petition. Likewise. So uh, Dan, is it just open it up for anybody that's against and then open it up for anybody that's in support? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I, I think we've already opened it up for folks uh, in favor of, and some folks have spoken. So we give the same opportunities to folks who might oppose, and then and then we take a vote after that. Okay, so the hearing is open. The hearing is open now for anyone who. Uh, has an opinion, whether in support or in opposition, just please state your name and address and your comment. Mm, Josh Hantrum, uh, 267 High Road, and I support it. Mark Cullen, 38 Ocean Street, in support. Gene Canty, 2 Lafayette Terrace, in support. Okay, I can make a motion, Mr. Chairman, if there's no one in, in the negative. Um, I move that the Board of Selectmen vote to approve the petition submitted by National Grid to excavate the public highway and to run and maintain underground electrical electric conduits together 
with such sustaining and protecting features as it may find necessary for the transmission of electricity, said underground conduits to be located substantially in accordance with a plan filed herewith marked Willow Road, Nahant, Massachusetts, 01908, and authorized the town administrator to sign the petition. Did we, did we have to uh, include the president's name on that? Um, I'm just reading the motion that was given to me. Okay, I'll second it. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, roll call vote. Gene Canty, aye. Mark Shalon, aye. Josh Eckerman. I move to I move to close the National Grid Public Hearing. Second. Any discussion? Hearing and sun, seeing none, roll call vote. Gene Canty, aye. Mark Shalon, aye. Josh Eckerman, aye. Um, I'm just looking down this list here to, yeah, why don't we just stick to the order and make Lynn Spencer wait just a few minutes because uh, we can get through this pretty quickly, I thank, think. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so new business, vote to award enterprise resource planning, financial software. Okay. I move that the Board of Selectmen approve Tyler Technologies to receive the bid award for the Enterprise Resource Planning Financial Software bid and authorize the town administrator to sign one bid award contract. Seconded. Uh, discussion. Um, I think this is the Munis software that the town voted on, Tony. Yes. Yep. Uh, um, so we, we, uh, Munis is like is the um, most well well known or most used financial software program in the Commonwealth. Um, it's rated the highest as far as like reviews and um, user um, you know friendly software for municipalities. However, they're not on the state contract, so we had to put out um, an RFP if we wanted to you know, potentially uh, have them bid on this project or use them as a potential vendor. And they were the only one that responded to our RFP. Uh, so they, and they came in under budget um, and it is, um, it's, it'll be a long project, um, but with the awarding of this contract, we are, you know, it's, it's only uphill from here. It's gonna be a great, um, significant improvement to the operation of the town finances. So um, urge you to vote uh, in support of awarding the contract. Yeah. Tony, did, uh, did Allison use this in Marblehead? Um, I don't know. I don't know if uh, if they had Munis in Marblehead. I believe, I believe they did, Tony. I mean, yeah, I'm pretty sure they did. As Tony, said, as Tony said, it's Munis is the sort of the gold standard for municipal software. So, well, her so this, is, I'm sure I was a little, a little jealous that Tony has it now. I never had it, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, had to to the, I had to listen to the accountant complain about it. <laughs> yeah. The other one that I got. So. Well, well, I, know. I got I got three. three years. I had three years of that. <laughs> uh, but you know, just so you know, the contract price that came in here is a one-time fee of one hundred and fifty-six thousand nine hundred and sixty-four dollars, um, and then a reoccurring annual fee for software-related services of forty-two thousand seven hundred and twenty-nine dollars. Um, so, originally, we went for the town. We went to the town for the authority to borrow three hundred thousand dollars to conduct this process. Um, some of that is for um, trainings. You know, this this is just the cost of the software, but we will have to pay for trainings. We might have to bring in some help to actually implement the program. So, but we're still, based on this quote, projected to come in under budget of what we asked uh, for borrowing authorization for. 
And as far as the reoccurring fee goes, we spend probably north of $42,000 currently on annual on our annual reoccurring fee for our current software that is way worse than what Munis is. So um, while, it's a, while it's a big price up front, it's actually a savings and an improvement on the operations of the town. So it's a huge, it's a huge win for us. So, I mean, a year ago you convinced the board uh, or the board was convinced that uh, this was a good investment and FinCom was um, recommended it at the town meeting and the, the town voters voted to approve the expenditure. So this is really uh, just formalization of all those past approvals. So I would think we simply go ahead and do it. And her use of this in Marblehead, if that is the case, would be a big plus and, and, and probably add to the training part of this, make it a lot easier for people. Okay, any discussion? Uh, uh, no more discussion? All right, uh, roll call vote. Gene Canty, aye. Alexander, aye. Um, the town hall and library envelope restoration RFP. Oh, so before you motion on this one, we're actually going to postpone this this vote. Yeah, uh, we yeah, we still have a little bit more review on the contractors that submitted bids. Um, so we're not quite prepared to award yet. Uh, we did get um, three bids. Um, two of them are. You know, the base bid is within the budget authorized by last year's CPC borrowing, um, but uh, we are going through the process of vetting those contractors. So we're actually going to skip this for tonight. Sounds good. Um, okay, the next one is a uh, vote to authorize Massachusetts Clean Water Trust loan. Yeah. I'm going to need a glass of water to read this motion, I think. Yeah, well. Uh, I'll give I'll give it a shot here. I move that one the town shall issue a bond or bonds in the aggregate principal amount not to exceed seven million six hundred thousand dollars, pursuant to chapters twenty nine C and forty four of the general laws and votes of the town passed September twenty six, two thousand twenty, Article fourteen as validated by chapter 45 of the acts of 2021, which authorized a bar total borrowing of 4,600,000 in September 27th, 2021, article one, which authorized a total borrowing of $3 million for the planning or construction of sewers and other water pollution control abatement infrastructures, i.e. the project. Two, that in anticipation of the issuance of the bonds, the treasurer is authorized to issue an interim loan note on notes from time to time in the aggregate principal amount not to exceed $7,600,000. That each bond or note shall be issued as a single registered security and sold to the Massachusetts Clean Water Trust, i.e. the trust at a price determined pursuant to the financing agreement. Four, that the treasurer is authorized to determine the date, the form, the maximum interest rate, and the principal maturities of each bond and note, and to execute a financing agreement with the trust, with the trust with respect to the sale of the bonds and notes, such date, form, and maturities, in the specific interest rates, rate or rates of the bonds and notes to be approved by a majority of the Board of Selectmen and the Treasurer and evidence by the execution of the bonds in our notes. Five, that any certificates or documents relating to each bond and note, collectively the documents, may be executed in several counterparts, each of which shall be regarded as an original and, and all of which shall constitute one in the same document. Delivery of an executed counterpart of a signature page to a document by electronic mail in a PDF file 
or by other electronic transmission shall be as effective as delivery of a manually executed counterpart signature page to such document. And electric, electronic signatures on any of the documents shall be deemed original signatures for the purposes of the documents and all matters related thereto, having the same legal effect as original signatures. Six, that all actions taken to date by the town and its offices and agents to carry out the project and its financing, including the execution of any loan commitment or agreement by the treasurer are hereby ratified, approved, and confirmed. And seven, that the treasurer and the, uh, and the other appropriate town officials are each hereby authorized to take any and all necessary action, necessary or convenient, excuse me, to take any and all actions necessary or convenient to carry out the provisions of this vote, including execution and delivery of the finance, financing agreement and the project regulatory agreement related to the project. Tony, before I second it, is there anything that you wanted to uh, add to this? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was very well read. Seconded. Um, I didn't catch all that, Mark. Can you read it again? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, okay, so this is uh, related to the borrowing for the sewer system. Um, this the, These funds have been approved at town meeting, but anyway, uh, you want to provide some additional background, Tony? It's, it's the motion that comes along with the authority to borrow through SRF, which is a short, um, a low interest loan uh, program through the state that was, as you mentioned, authorized by the town through town meeting vote twice. Uh, so now that we are uh, completing the project or in process of, of uh, getting the project done, we are um, you know, paying the contractor and need to submit invoices to the SRF program to be reimbursed. Uh, it's, it's kind of functions like a construction loan. Uh, so this authorization is required for us to, you know, proceed with that, so. Yep, so just a, just a formalization of um, what's already been voted on a town meeting and um, I'm glad you brought up the construction loan because that means um, we, we sort of, uh, we don't use all that money necessarily. We we pay the invoices as they come and those are the upper limits on the loan. So um, again, just a formalization, what's already been passed at, at town meeting. Um, that's all the discussion I had. I don't know if anybody else has anything else. All right. Um, hearing and seeing none, roll call vote. Gene Canty, aye. I fell in aye. Josh Andrew, my. All right, what's next? Okay, I move that the Board of Selectmen approve the appointment of Jim Dolan to the Community Preservation Committee. Second it. Okay, um, any discussion? This is an at-large position. Um, the Board of Selectmen, I believe, have three of those. Um, this, this seat has been vacant and uh, Jim Dolan has been, uh, you know, looking to get involved with uh, the community for a while. And, um, you know, I, I uh, have vetted this appointment with Lynn Spencer and, um, we're all excited to have him join the team. So this is the Jim Dolan that you have age, not his father, right? Correct. Okay. <laughs> that was a great choice. Of course, either one of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody named Jim Dolan? <laughs> yeah, that's great. It's uh, always nice to have uh, someone on the younger side get involved in uh, town committees. So sounds great. Good choice. Um, any other discussion? Um, 
Is Jim on the phone by any chance? I see a couple unidentifiable participants here, but um, I don't think he's on. Okay. All right. Um, well, if there's no more discussion, roll call vote. Gene Canty, I. Black Hill, I. Josh Antramai. Um, okay. I have a lot of windows open on my computer here. Uh, what's next? <clears throat> Hold on, I gotta... Swim request. Oh yeah, swim request for a beach cleanup. Do we have a motion on that? Um, where are we here? Just put that away. I move the Board of Selectmen vote to approve the event request for swim beach cleanup on uh, Sunday, May 22nd, 2022 from 11 a.m. to 2, to 2 p.m. Second. Um, any discussion? Uh, well, thanks again to SWIM for organizing another beach cleanup. Uh, it says here, volunteers and participants should meet at the Lowlands parking lot and will then go to Doggy Beach and Short Beach to begin the cleanup. Sounds great. I'm sure we'll repeat that as we get closer to the date. Yeah. Yeah, May 22nd seems like a long ways away, but um, yeah, I'd like to thank SWIM for yet another uh, beach cleanup. They, they do a great job with that. For sure. All right, roll call vote. Gene Canty, aye. Matt Cullen, aye. Josh Andrew, aye. Um, we moving on to ongoing business. We've already had our um, joint meeting with the housing authority. Um, so Lynn, it is your time to review the uh, CPC articles that were approved at the 2021 annual town meeting. Okay, well, thank you. It's been, it's been a pleasure to be hearing parts of this meeting because they relate uh, to uh, community preservation and the upcoming round of grant applications. So before I do my report on last year's appropriations, let me just remind listeners that the uh, fiscal year 23 grant applications are available online on the town hall website. The applications are due January 28th. And That's I believe, right yep, it's coming right up. And I believe that we have already, we have received two or three applications so far. So more will come. Um, we are indebted as a committee to uh, Christine, Taylor, who is actually serving as our point of contact, helping with uh, ad administering the uh, taking minutes, holding on to the grant applications, distributing them, and um, actually helping make sure that that website application is uh, usable by users. So in fact, I had an email from her today saying, oh, we're having a few more glitches with it. So we're trying to make that an easy, fillable um, document. So thanks to Kristen. But most importantly, and I'm sorry I missed the beginning of this meeting, but we as a committee are indebted deeply to Ellen Steves, who was an important member of our committee and who is passing this past weekend is, is, is mourned. She was really committed, uh, kind, generous, and um, a faithful attendee and a faithful commentator on our applications. So she will be very sorely missed. Well, all right, so to the matter at hand. Last year, we had a banner year of, of uh, appropriations because we were combining two years of C community preservation appropriations in one town meeting. And uh, the town meeting approved over $757,000 worth of um, grant funded projects in three areas, historic preservation, um, affordable housing or community housing and open space and recreation. So um, Mr. Chairman, do you want me to just go through the list or how shall? Yeah, I mean, if, if that's convenient for you, I'd just say, you know, go through the list. I think you have 21 
articles that were approved last uh, last town meeting. And if you just want to read them off and where we're at with each one, I yep. don't think we need to spend a lot of detail on, yep. unless there's uh, some reason to spend a lot of detail. Okay, so I just want to warn everyone, it starts with A and goes down to V. So get ready. <laughs> Almost the whole alphabet. Fill your seat, Bill. <laughs> okay. So um, we we did appropriate ten thousand dollars for uh, general administration. Um, that is this past week we'll be paying for our community preservation coalition dues, which are one thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. Um, we will also be assisting um, the town hall with an with some money to help with a some planning related to a grant application coming up um because we you know we we said you we can give small amounts of money to help plan and get the cost estimates for um good applications uh next was uh th we had appropriated thirty two thousand three hundred and seventy five dollars towards the L flash road little league fields um, that has actually been matched by uh, the Little League organization by $15,000. And that was for backstops and um, fencing. And that work has been completed. So both the match plus our appropriation has been spent. Uh, next was the sign for the uh, American Legion at the life saving station and everyone who has passed by has seen yeah that that project's done very handsome sign was produced. Uh, item D was the appropriation of $120,000 which is actually joining a previous appropriation of $160,000 for a total of $280,000 to replace the flash road basketball and tennis courts. That project is substantially complete. Um, I think it, what, what we're waiting for now is good temperatures for the final um, painting applications. So that will be ready for basketball, tennis, and it's also been lined in for pickleball. So we know there are very enthusiastic pickleball players and we expect them out to be out there all the time. <laughs> um, that court, by the way, does have lights. So, you know, if you feel inclined at three o'clock in the morning to play pickleball, well, go at it. <laughs> I don't know if we're gonna allow the lights to go on. At oh, come on, Tony. <laughs> uh, those pickleball people can get pretty rowdy. Oh, okay. We'll be, we'll be aware of that. Um, item E on my list is, in fact, with the appropriation of $500,000 um, in the form of a bond that is divided between the public library work, some work on town hall, and some work on the entry gate at Greenlawn Cemetery. Mm -hmm. So you've heard from Tony that the bids have been received on the library project, which also included all alternates for town hall. And um, those are under review at this point. So the bond hasn't been taken, um, but the project is bid. And that, by the way, also um, was success. Karen Hawks, Sharon Hawks was successful in getting a Massachusetts Preservation Projects Fund grant to add to that pot. So there's another $50,000 that is going in there as well. Uh, next on my list um, is, in fact, the second year of the bond for a previous $400,000 bond that was taken for the library. And that was that actually resulted in the, the structural repairs and the rebuilding on the terrace that wraps around two sides of that building. And that was also, that was accomplished in 2020 um, and that bond was taken. So this is the second year of that, that bond. Um, $50,000 was appropriated for the Ellingwood Chapel. That project is pending. 
um, that is for uh, that was was specifically for some continuing work of, on flashing on the tower and then re recoding the interior. The next item was a seventeen thousand dollars that was appropriated to, uh, for the uh, Nahant Dory Club as part of the floating docks that they had installed there. They also had had provided over $66,000 towards that project, which has been accomplished. $45,000 was appropriated for the housing work. You heard from Kelly earlier that the work on the uh, Spring Road property is complete. So that succeeded. The next one was $155,000 for the Greystone uh, Road property, and that is under re uh, that's under uh, design right now. So that's that's pending for in for implementation. Forty four one thousand dollars was appropriated under the open space category for Bailey's Hill for the beginning of the um, removal of invasive species and um, some trail restoration mainly on the easterly side of Bailey's Hill. Um, that, that is under the, that has the involvement of the Open Space Committee. And I think that there will be probably another grant coming in for fiscal year 23 for additional planning work as a master plan for Bailey's Hill. $27,000 was appropriated for the lowland softball fields for various work related to back stops, stops and, and, pa and pathways. And that has been, Tony, help me. I believe that's completed. Yeah. That's complete. Yeah. Uh, we've, we still have, I think we have a little bit of funding left over to put uh, a fresh layer of clay down in the spring, but all of the major work is completed. Yeah, that's great. $165,000 was appropriated for handicapped access work at Town Hall. This was following a study that had been, had been accomplished two years before, which identified a number of deficiencies in handicapped access, including the, ramp, the exterior ramp to the building, hardware, and other things. So there's going to be a range of, of activities related to handicapped access improvements, which is very important for us. We want everyone to be able to use town hall, but that, that project is, is now um, pending. I think once we, you know, now that we, the same contract, the same engineer that was working on the library town hall bid is gonna be working on this one. So oh, good. So priority, that's was to, you know, yeah. priority was to get that bid out and, once we kind of close that chapter, we can start working on the bid docs for this project. That's great. Uh, Twenty-four thousand dollars was was appropriated for the little Nahant uh, playground, and that is all. That's pending. Uh, Tony has spoken about you know arranging, convening meetings with neighbors and users to actually make sure that it is designed in such a way that meets you know the broadest needs and expectations. That meeting is coming up. Uh, actually tonight, our contractor for the Short Beach Dune uh, close to Little Nahant is in front of the CONCOM submitting their NOI. And okay. so our goal was once that goes through CONCOM, we were going to have a neighborhood meeting to brief them on that project and also talk to them about the playground equipment and get that ordered for a spring install. That's good. Let's see, we have $12,000 that was appropriated for the Spring Road basketball, basketball court and that is complete. Yes, it is. And then we had a number of little sort of articles that sort of pulled back uh, monies that had not been spent. So there were clawbacks. The last article was V was the appropriation for um, the East Point uh, bond for the, as part of the whole eminent domain. And of course that is pending um, as well. So 
that is my report on the articles from last year that were appropriated. Um, we do have one or two, we've got a small group of previous articles that still have balances in their accounts. And notably, one of them is the, is the grant that was given to the Council on Aging for the kitchen renovation at Town Hall. And I think we have had several, uh, several conversations with them as to whether that project actually is going to be proceeding in the way it was envisioned. And I believe that that has been substantially abridged and it's likely that that $50,000 will be pulled back into the fund. Um, that's not official, but that seems to be the way that that is going. So in terms of the, the fiscal year 23, um, we have a very strong um, match uh, capability that has been demonstrated by the, by the state funding. In the past, we have been seeing match state matches of around 60, between 60 and as much as 70% of our real estate tax sur surcharge. That tax surcharge is around $230,000. You know, last year we had a had it like a 69.4% match. It is very likely that we'll be above that this year in the match coming from the state, which means potentially, you know, instead of having around $370,000 to, to uh, look at for grant making, we could be closer to $400,000. And we also carry a quite healthy reserves for the, in the general reserve, we've got about $266,000 in that account. And 202,000 uh, is, is in the housing uh, category. So as we think about, you know, the housing production study and all of that, we certainly have a capability of participating with community preservation money, not only out of the annual 10% minimum from our fund, but out of the housing reserve that has been accumulated. So that's my report. Great. I'm on. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was that was great. Um, you know, it's I'm so happy that Nahat joined this Community Preservation Act way back in 2004. Yeah. Um, these mon monies, as many people know, are separate from the general fund. So, um, you know, I, I view them as quality of life programs that keep our historical buildings um, in good shape and our public housing in good shape and recreation. So it's, it's really makes the town a special place. And um, it's great that um, we're able to leverage that state state match. So thank you very much. Mr. 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 Chairman, I want to add, I think Lynn, um, you know, I don't want to Talk about how long we've been around. I believe you are on the original. You started in two thousand four, right? So yes, you're, I you're, did. One the, you're one of the longest serving uh, uh, committee members in probably town history. <laughs> oh no, I, I wouldn't say that at all. Well, you're getting I, up there. Yeah, I, I I could possibly be, but yes, I I am privileged to uh, to be on this committee, and and I well, I actually appreciate. It. Yeah, we're lucky to have you. Thank you for your service. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Dean. It's good to hear you. <laughs> All right. So uh, the next item on the agenda is preserving East Point, and uh, Jeff Blake already gave us a rundown of um, um, the legal status. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't have anything to add to that. I don't know, um, Gene or Mark. If Anything else you want to add? No, I'm glad you, I've got Jeff um, to come in and give us a summary because uh, I don't think any one of us could have <laughs> could have done justice yeah. to that. <laughs> so you know, I can understand that it's even more to articulate. So he did a great job. Yeah, he was good. Thank you. All right, um, town administrator's report, the highlight of the meeting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, best for last. 
Um, I'll, I'll try to be quick, but stop me if you have any questions about any of these topics. Um, obviously, we are, you know, we are in the process of building the budget. We are meeting with our department heads, um, Allison and I. We're going, you know, basically every every other Wednesday. It's it's a board of select meeting or it's a FinCom meeting, and then sprinkle that in with CPC meetings too. So we're also working on, you know, getting our CPC applications prepared, you know, for next week's deadline. Um, but I am happy to report that we have been, uh, we were, we applied for a, a, a cybersecurity training grant. Uh, we were awarded that. So we are going through the process where all of our employees will um, participate in uh, essentially four hours over a year of training, uh, online training, um, how to identify cyber, cyber scams and phishing and different things like that. Uh, so happy to report that we're moving on that, moving forward with that. As I mentioned in the last uh, segment, our short beach NOI is in front of the CONCOM tonight. Uh, hopefully uh, Trey from Applied Coastal is um, successful there and we can you know, move forward on that project. Essentially, the design that's in front of the CONCOM for permitting extends from Little Knot to the Life Saving Station. Um, currently, we only have funding from 2018's damage, uh, damage funds from the 2018 storm, uh, which really is focusing on the portion of the dune that was lost due to that storm, which is adjacent to the playground. So while we're going for a larger permit in case we come into some funding, um, we're only gonna have enough money to just do that portion, but it's much, it's very much needed. And as I mentioned, we'll be doing a neighborhood meeting um, once the NOI is approved. Hey, Tony, on that subject, if I could, uh, there was an article in the item today on Swampskits dredging in their harbor and looking at that and thinking about it you now more likely they'll use it for their own beaches whatever they dredge up because that's perfect sand for what for the uh, consistency we're looking for but if they're not it might be a good idea for us to, uh, for you to make a call to your counterpart over there and see if they want to release uh, some of that and we could take it and use it certainly um I read the article too. I think they're still kind of in the master plan phase. It's, it's still a ways away, but whenever, you know, if that ever comes to fruition and we have the opportunity to get our hands on some of that compatible sand, we should yeah. definitely take advantage of that. Perfect. Um, the last time Swampscott Harbor was dredged, I think I was the project engineer when I was working for the state was back in the mid 1980s. And I believe the method we used, we pumped the sand um, onto the beach um, and we had a nightmare because of all of the lost moorings that were there and the pumps were getting, oh, it, was a, it was a nightmare. So oh, yeah. uh, you might get a lot of sand, but you might get a lot of old mooring, <laughs> moorings and stuff too. Yeah. But it's a good, good Joe idea. Marie, I'm not Joe sure Marie how has already gotten, Joe yeah. Marie has already gotten all the moorings. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's a good idea. They might be barging it out. Typically what they do is uh, some communities pump, pump it, um, but more than likely they dredge it. Uh, they have to do some testing of the sand first to make sure there's no contaminants in it. Um, if there's not, then there's a dumping site about a mile and a half or so offshore that they bring it out and dump it. But if we could use it, you might give them a call. Yeah, that'd be great. So uh, this project, as I mentioned, you know, is funded through FEMA from damage money that came with the storm of 2018. So it can really only be spent to restore what existed prior to that storm. Meanwhile, we have an application into BRIC um, regarding the, you know, increasing the height of the entire dune from Little Nahat all the way to, you know, the cemetery. Um, side of Short Beach. So 
um, you know, we are, uh, we're, it's looking good. We've had a ton of calls with, um, with MEMA and CZN regarding that application. And we've gotten, a, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback. So I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, count it before it occurs, um, but it seems like we're heading in the right direction there. And we're, we're applying for, you know, north of a million dollars for that project. So hopefully, hopefully we get, um, we're successful on that. Um, we also signed the contract. We, I don't know if you remember, we had, we got uh, through the uh, state Senator Crichton and representative Capano, we received a $50,000 uh, grant or earmark through last year's budget for telecommunication improvements in the town. And what we're using that money, we just signed the contract with uh, the state um, ANF uh, to actually receive those funds. We're using that money to connect all of our municipal buildings with fiber cable, which will allow us to um, our server, it improves our cybersecurity. And it also allows us to, you know, if the town hall purchases, let's say the internet through Verizon or Comcast, we can then share that to our other buildings under that one account instead of you know, each building having its own account. So there's a ton of um, efficiency upgrades that come with that project. It also fil uh, um, filters into the radio the police radio project that was approved at last year's town meeting. So it's kind of an initial step. So we're looking um, hopefully to get that project. Uh, now that we've signed the contract with the state for the funds, we can um, start issuing, you know, a notice to proceed with the contractor to get that wire installed. Um, assessment of the Ward Road pump station is, uh, has, is somewhat complete. There's still a couple more electrical engineers to come in and take a look um, at the building, but we've, we've asked Wright Pierce under our existing contract um, to provide us an assessment of the pump station at Ward Road. And they did, they were out there last week. They've actually produced a, um, like a uh, 3D, um, survey of the building similar to if you were to take a virtual tour of a house that's on the market uh, on like realtor.com they produce a similar um, file uh, for us regarding the pump station which you can actually engineers can use that to measure um, and determine you know what type of costs are associated with upgrades or fixes so um, really good work that's being done there and um, going to be very helpful in our long-term capital planning. Uh, so that's underway. Um, our LED uh, conversion project for interior lighting is underway. Uh, phase one at the school is complete. They're, I think they finished up with the town hall uh, this week. And then they're going to the police station and the fire station, DPW, library and they're converting our lights into um you know efficient led efficient light bulbs so uh, that's going to produce a significant significant amount of savings for the town instantly all through the all through the green communities grant so at no cost for the town um so that's a that's really uh positive that that project is uh almost completed and then Lastly, uh, Stantec, I don't know, you may have seen them around town. They are underway uh, conducting the sign audit and sidewalk audit. Um, unfortunately, uh, the quote, you know, the, the contract that we have, uh, that we have put forward with them was for the assessment side, a sign inventory and assessment was for 475 signs. That was our estimate of how many signs or um, street signs are in the town. Not like street names, but as far as like parking or speed limit, one way, dead end, that type, type of thing. Our estimate was 475 signs. They have, um, <laughs> they have 
completed Little Nahant and gotten a little bit into the lowlands area and have already hit 475 signs. Wow. So there's way more signs than we estimated. Um, so they've come back to me and said, you know, you know, for us to complete continue, it's going to come at an extra cost at about $18 per sign. They estimate about a thousand signs, which would mean an extra, almost about an extra $10,000 to the cost of this study. So it's a significant, a significant increase, but, um, you know, we, we're using chapter 90 funds. If there's any year to, to utilize chapter 90 funds, it's now because we haven't used, we haven't, we essentially didn't get any paving done last year. So we still have last year's allocation. We're going to have next year's this summer. So um, I think it's worth it. And um, probably going to, you know, unless I hear anything, any opposition from you, um, I think it's worth it to, to authorize them to continue, continue on and conduct and final, you know, conduct the full assessment of the town. Are they suggesting sign removals? Yeah, everything from the first part, the first part of this of the assessment is literally going out and taking pictures of signs, grading them as far as what do they say, where are they located, what what is the condition of the pole that they are on? Are they visible? Um, what material are they made of? And they're putting all that information on a GIS layer. So, um, you know, which is a huge, it's like the key to, uh, for our police station to enforce those, you know, tickets. You know, when we get an appeal for a ticket that we write, we can just pull up that information. Then once, they complete that, they're gonna say, you don't need this many signs over here, you know, or you need a sign over here. You know, they're gonna provide those recommendations to us. They're gonna give us a capital plan. And then they will, as we complete those objectives, they will update that GIS layer. So. Perfect. Sounds great. I'm sure the signs will um, all sort of match in you know, have the same fonts and the same colors, and uh, yeah, that, that'd be great. And they remembered you, Mark, from the uh, sidewalk study that you did as town yeah. administrator. They still had a lot of that information in their system. Yeah, they, no, they're good. They they know their traffic pretty well. Yeah. What's the uh, current contract number value? Uh, for the sign. Audit, it's fourteen seven. So that would increase to twenty four grand, basically, or twenty five grand for the sidewalk and ramp condition assessment. That's twelve thousand six hundred. So the current scope is twenty seven thousand three hundred for both for both projects, which is a good deal for for the amount of work that's being put into this. But you know now it's another ten thousand because we have so many signs. I mean, it's tough because you know it's it's also alarming that we have that many signs in Little Nahant and just in the Lowlands area. And you don't want to, you know, now's the time to do it. We have we have them out here. We have you know another ten thousand dollars from Chapter ninety compared to if you spent that on paving. I think it's worth it to get the study done. Yeah, I mean, I hate to, I hate to spend more money, but um, as you know, Tony, one of my uh, pet projects or pet interests is is the signage in town. So, yeah, I agree, Josh. What was that? Our got the what was that song? Sign signs everywhere, signs. <laughs> yeah, do this don't do that. Something. Like that. <laughs> um. Yeah, and hopefully, hopefully Trey made out well with uh, CONCOM today. I know a lot of people are excited to see some demonstration of that dune, so. Oh, I just got a text from Trey. It says it was approved by CONCOM, so good news there. Great news. Okay, so that's my report. All right.
And uh, we skipped around a little bit, but I think we got to everything except for citizens forums, right? So uh, with that, citizens forums next. Hey, I've just got one question before we go into that. Tony, are we gonna be meeting with the uh, planning board and CONCOM the next meeting? Um, I haven't sent out an invite yet, but that's the plan uh, would be um, our next meeting is Second, I think February second. So um, you know, I'll, I'll send an invite out to both committees. Um, you know, tomorrow or the next day. Great, thanks. All right. So, citizens forum. If anybody uh, has any questions or comments, they can unmute themselves or type a question into the chat. Uh, if you're on Zoom. Anything in the chat, Tony? Nothing in the chat. Okay. All right, going once, going twice. Okay. Um, we have a motion to adjourn. Motion for adjournment. Second. Um, roll call vote. Gene Canty, aye. Uh, come on, aye. Ashant from I. Thank you, everyone. And talk to you on February 2nd. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night.